Hello, my name is Bill Nix, and I'm standing outside the new South Florida Science Center and Aquarium. On today's show, we're going to speak to Lou Prampton, who's executive director of the center. And he's going to tell us about all the great things that are behind that door. So come with me so we can go on a journey into science at the new South Florida Science Center and Aquarium. I have the pleasure of sitting with Lou Crampton, who is Executive Director for the Science Center and Aquarium, excuse me, the South Florida Science Center and Aquarium. And Lou, welcome to Cultural Capital. Thanks a lot, Bill. I'm happy to be here with you. We're happy to have not only <laughs> you here, but this expanded Science Center and Aquarium is just marvelous. And we're going to talk about it a little bit more. but. How did you get to uh, Palm Beach County to, to do this? Because you haven't been here very long. Well, it's a pretty circuitous route, and I've <laughs> always said that my career mantra is that it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> well, for us, it is a great idea. Oh, uh, well, so. thank you very much. I've, uh, I was a senior official, uh, uh, an associate administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency oh, uh, wow. back during the first George Bush administration. I was commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Community Affairs ran for Congress in Massachusetts, uh, mm. was a senior vice president at Waste Management. So I've had a lot of corporate as well as public as well as private sector experience. Yeah, I'm trying to find a connection. <laughs> I'm trying to get to science. There, <laughs> well, I, I would not say that I am a scientist <laughs> per se. Yes. Uh, I kind of got in, backed into it by accident when I went out to uh, Rockford, Illinois, hmm. uh, a, a, a city of about uh, 150,000 people in North uh, Northern Illinois, right. and they just built a new museum there, and they were looking for someone to run it. They had spent, you know, twelve million dollars on this museum, but they didn't have anything to show uh. in the museum. There were just a lot of empty exhibit rooms. So, when I got out there and talked to the board and staff, I said, "Well, why don't we go find a dinosaur? Because we're a natural history museum. Okay. We got a permit." Right. And we went out into the field. <clears throat> we went out into southeastern Montana, uh, at, near a place called Ekalaka, Montana, mm. called the Hell Creek Formation. Okay. Out into the field, and wouldn't you know it, lightning strikes. And to make a long story short, we make one of the ten most significant finds in paleontology. Wow. We found a, what, at the, we didn't know at the time, but it was yeah. a juvenile T Rex. Uh, about 65% complete, the third most complete T-Rex in, in the world, and the only juvenile. And Discovery Channel did a big documentary on the find and the issues that we had trying to determine its real identity, which was very complex because it looked like another type of dinosaur, and yeah. so we had scientists warring all over the place. Wow. And, and the bug hit you. And the, <laughs> the lightning bolt has were in the center of, uh, you know. About that? So uh, by the time I came down here in 2009, I came down to Florida to do what everybody else does, to play golf. Uh oh. <laughs> and to retire and to take yeah. it easy. Sure. And I joined uh, our local planning and zoning commission. I, I sing with the Master Chorale of South Florida, oh, which is based good, uh, yeah. down in uh, Miami and, uh, and uh, Fort Lauderdale and uh, was on the board of the zoo and some other things. And, and kind of what happened is that a story about our dinosaur find back up in Rockford appeared in the local paper. And it was at a time when there were some leadership issues mm -hmm. at, at this museum, the South Florida Science Museum. Yeah. Uh, so I was asked to step in, which I did, and uh, the rest, is, the rest yeah. is history. Well, I tell you, that's, that's fabulous and fascinating <laughs> because you're, you're kind of like a renaissance man in the sense of music and science and all these things. But I remember meeting you because yeah. when you came to the Cultural Council as, I guess, the executive director at that time, the South Florida Science Museum. Correct. And uh, you had a vision. It was a vision that really kind of started a long time ago before you got here. That's right. 
but I remember you speaking really passionately about expanding this place. Right. And what was your vision for it at the time? What did, what did you see? Well, what did the board see? What I saw, first of all, was to, was first of all, my first thought was Palm Beach County is, has one and a half million people in it. And it deserves a great science museum. Yes. And I said, if we can make that message clear to our 1.5 million residents, we will get support. Now, we had to work through some issues because yes. this museum had tried earlier and it failed. It got caught in the headwinds of a recession. Sure. And a major sure. campaign that was planned never came off. And we lost some credibility. I came in after that. And I thought if I could demonstrate that the museum could operate successfully in the black with good solid surpluses uh, and a vision to mm -hmm. succeed, then I thought we could make it. And another thing that I think helped Bill is that uh, I tried to focus on uh, opening every mind to science, uh -huh. not just to get people to be scientifically literate, yes. but because of the jobs. Uh, Palm Beach County has spent a lot of money to bring organizations like Max Planck and Scripps and yes. Tory Pines here, yes. and yet they're looking for people to fill those jobs even now. So I thought if we could help our school district and other people get active on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math yes. kinds of issues to right. make them fun, then we could make a solid case to the people here in this county that they ought to support us. Well, I tell you, uh, I remember Cultural Capital, I did a program here at the Science Center that was sponsored by Max Planck right. uh, during the time, and you had, had a, a tent outside. Yeah, the big science, uh, the, the, the big exhibit that the they had. The big have, exhibit. Right. Science Tunnel. Science, science Tunnel. Science Tunnel. That's, That's what it's called. called. Fascinating, yeah. and, and just great crowds coming and understanding the complexity of what Max Planck and other were trying to do, but that's why you need a science center, yeah. to bring that interpretive message of science and make it hands-on, make it fun, make it a learning experience. Well, I mean, studies show that uh, informal science, which is the hands-on, the fun part, yes. is equally important to formal science, is what you get in books and classrooms, right. to having the penny drop for people. They understand and get excited about it. And as I said, uh, United States competitiveness in this world with China and India and other countries out there <clears throat> spending all that money and focusing on science, we need to keep up. And okay. right now, according to a recent report by the National Academy of Science, we rank number 13 in the mm. world. Our, our high school graduates num rank, rank number 13 in the world, behind Finland yeah. <laughs> in terms of readiness, readiness for uh, exactly. college level yeah. science courses. Well, and the S South Florida Science Museum has always uh, partnered with the school district and really becomes kind of a laboratory for school kids to come and get that hands-on experience. Yeah, exactly. What we provide is enrichment, enrichment. to the to the school programs. We and we've been very successful, uh, Bill, in getting grants from federal agencies, from foundations, and mm -hmm. other organizations. And we just turn around and take those classes and we put them into uh, into the public schools. For example. We have a contract uh, to teach 2,400 fourth graders in Title I schools uh, the scientific method. Yes. Uh, we've got another core, we've got another grant for health science in motion that talks about nutrition and healthy eating and you can and DNA. You can make a DNA scan out of Twizzlers and marshmallow, and after you create your own DNA, which you test from getting a swab inside your mouth, you get to eat the product after wow. it's all over. So <laughs> that makes it fun. <laughs> that's the kind. That's the kind of stuff we do. When the South Florida Science Museum first opened in 1961, the, the population of Palm Beach County was only 260,000 people. Ah. Today we're at 1.5 million, and we're we're 50 years old. And you <clears throat> hadn't really expanded. No, from the physical plant <laughs> footprint we, in all we, those years. We were a cabinet of curiosities, is what we were. <laughs> <laughs> and but <clears throat> the interesting thing is that people liked it. Yes, uh, we were we were very popular with families with young children. They would come here, and even though the museum had very little curb appeal. Uh, kind of dark and kind of dingy yeah. uh, in many respects. I mean, everybody tried hard to get it to the highest standard. People loved it, and that's yeah. I saw that as something that we could build on. 
Okay. And uh, so that's the, the expansion. The expansion the, came on that. And you've got this now large area that you can bring uh, yeah. traveling exhibits and. And I know we're going to look yeah. uh, the second half of this wonderful aquarium, aquarium you've yeah. got there. But your your vision then was to transform this thing and create what? Well, to create uh, create edutainment, Edut <laughs> to create eye candy, but to create also solid learning. For yeah. most people, you really have to make sure that it, that the message gets across. Uh, people in my field hate the word edutainment. But I'm not oh, afraid oh. to say it right here on this show. That's, right, what we're it. <laughs> that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to educate people and entertainment, entertainment so they will listen. Now mm. here, we're in the middle of this 6,000 square foot space, which is double the traveling exhibit space we had before. And we could put on some amazing shows here. We're sitting in the midst of some very ferocious fish yeah. uh, that swam in the ocean 70 million years ago. Who knows? These fish were found in Kansas, Nebraska, uh, you know, the central, the Oklahoma panhandle. <laughs> who, who would think about that? Yeah. Nobody would. Nobody would, especially folk like us from yeah, South right. Florida. But I tell you, when you guys opened, and there was great buzz, still is, because mm -hmm. uh, you really haven't been open more than a couple of months yeah, now. Yeah, less than that. And, and I, I tell you, Lou, I came for the grand opening. Yeah. And I was really ready to come in and tell you how well <laughs> I could not get a parking space. I mean, seriously, cars were all the way back out to Southern uh, Boulevard. It was incredible. How many people did you have? Well, we couldn't, we didn't realize that we were going to be so successful yeah. ourselves. Of course, if you tell people something is free, I <laughs> might do it. If you build it, they will come. We had about, we had about 4,500 people that day, and about 1,500 of them waited in the rain for yes. an hour or two and couldn't get in so we had to issue them free passes to come back. Uh, we, it was uh, this place was I mean, we exceeded our design capacity uh, the fire marshal was not very happy with us and was standing next to us as we clicked people in and and, wow. and clicked people out but what a great problem oh it's hugely successful yeah. we were we we're so happy and I have to say that the uh, that that the performance hasn't really let up we are at this point we are doing twice the amount of revenues and about 75% of the number of visitors okay. as we were seeing at this time last year. Oh, wow. And that we, before we were hit with a construction yeah. impact. So we're, we're just riding on a, on a wave now. Right. And I tell you, you could, invoke, could not have opened at a better time we than could the not. summer right now with all that's going on. That, that kids really need this kind of hands-on, interactive, and I say kids, but adults as well, because yeah. it's been fascinating. It just was, it was a fortuitous, we planned, we tried to plan it that way, and, and for the most part, everything we planned came out the way we intended, yeah. which is not always the case, but <clears throat> we did hope to open early in June, uh, take advantage of the fact that school was out, yeah. that camps and other groups would be coming in here, uh, that the weather would be hot, and we have lovely air conditioning here, uh, and that uh, we didn't plan for rain, but we, and we've had some rain, and that always uh, helps us when, right. uh, when we have rain. Well, that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, rain is a good <laughs> thing. It's a good right, thing, right. right. Well, I tell you, this is exciting, and we want to take the uh, viewing public to see some of what all this excitement is sure. about. Sure. So we're going to come back in the second section of this show and really kind of talk to you a little bit about the aquarium and the science sphere yep. and some other things. So come back. Welcome back to the second segment of the Science Center and Aquarium, and that's exactly where we are right now. This incredible aquarium in Lou, this is fabulous. I tell you, <laughs> thinking about the way it was going to look on the pictures, but then now being here, seeing it fully populated, it's tremendous. Congratulations on this. Well, thank you, Bill. There's about a million and a half dollars worth of uh, equipment and fish and everything else in here. Tell us how, how you built this, how this got well, built. Well, it's, it's, we've been planning it for over a year, and the concept we had, I think, was effective. Mm -hmm. We decided to make it native to our area. 
and we wanted to go from the Gulf Stream, from the ocean, yes. and show the fishes and the animals that, were, that inhabited that area, then move into the reef environment near shore, then we move to what you might find off the dock when you set your foot into the water <laughs> on the inland waterway, and then into freshwater uh, milieu. Uh, so we wanted to, and we particularly want to show invasives, that is fish that people had in their aquarium that came from other parts of the world, like snakeheads. No, I know. Or paku. And so the reason for that was what? To, 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 uh, it's a cautionary us? tale yeah. uh, for local sport fishers and others. It's not a good idea to throw out a snakehead yes. <laughs> if you happen to have one. Right. Those things will eat anything and they're, they're voracious feeders and they're very difficult to exterminate. Okay, so they're part of the display. They're, that part, of the, uh, they're part of the display, although the one we had, we're getting another one, but the one we had was, was so strong that it forced its way out of the aquarium. It pushed up the cover on the aquarium and jumped out. And you know, these animals, snakeheads can live out of water did not know that for some period of time yeah. and in the end it finally died but it probably was there overnight uh, but it had taken such a big fall these 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 fish are are very very ferocious I mean wow. the the show river monsters yes. which is on cable television yes. well they had a whole segment on snakeheads and we had one here until it uh, it immolated itself <laughs> trying to escape from its tank. <laughs> but, but you'll get another one. Back. We'll get you'll, another one. We'll get another one. That's right. Well, this, this whole aquarium, if I may say so, yeah. this whole aquarium is about to be featured uh, on a television show. That's where I was going with yeah, this. I heard, yeah. I heard that. What's well, the television show? Well, there's a television show called Fish Tank Kings, and yes. it's on the National Geographic Wild Channel, which in our neighborhood, I think, is Channel 389 on Comcast. Okay. And they are going to do a whole show about the aquarium. They are going. They they started filming uh, five or six months ago when all around us was a dirt floor and the tanks weren't in. And I was saying, well, we want that to go there. We want that mm. to go there. And uh, basically, they've done a lot of other filmings since then, bringing in the big tanks and so right. forth, and the opening. So the it should be a real good show. Now. Who was the, the company that built this? And did you all really have great input into that? And the other question, I always wonder, where do you get the fish from? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> we worked with a company called Living Color. Mm -hmm. we, worked, we looked at a number of firms from around the country, but the firm we actually went with is located down in Fort Lauderdale, okay. right near here. And they're the firm, for example, that did the Florida Marlins Aquarium. They did the aquarium out at the Atlantis Resort, uh, Paradise oh, okay. Island in yeah. the Bahamas. Uh, they've done major aquarium installations throughout the world. And because they're good, they have this TV show uh, with National Geographic. I have seen it. And we, we are the, we are the, we're the featured, we're the featured aquarium. Very good, very good. Well, take us a little bit about, you just said you wanted to get the ocean, you wanted to get the, right. um, Fresh water, yeah. And so, how is it broken up? I understand you got really fourteen different aquariums. Got fourteen different tanks. Uh, the when you first come in, what you see is this big round tank with about twenty or thirty silvery look down fish. And the whole mm. idea is to is to tr is to look at that aquarium like a kaleidoscope, okay. because these look downs are schooling and spinning around. It's really quite a sight. As you come into the museum and as you come into the aquarium, we have our big ocean going tank. We call it the shipwreck tank. There's actually a big ship wrecked in the bottom of it. And uh, we have a lot of coral and other things. And in that tank uh, is a five foot green moray eel. Pretty fantastic. Yes. Uh, we have a big nurse shark in there with a remora riding on it. Uh, we're adding some sharks to that tank. In addition to that, we have a couple of, uh, of barracuda. They like to swim on top of everything, kind of riding sentry yes, over everything. Yes. And then a bunch of grunts and groupers and I think a lobster uh, and a whole lot of other stuff that divers would find out in the Gulf Stream. And you know, the Gulf Stream at its closest point is right off our shoreline, about three miles off of yeah. uh, Palm Beach shores is where the Gulf Stream is. Which is great for us and oh, great for, for absolutely. all the fishing. And, and the, the great thing about this is, so kids and adults can come in here and actually see it and experience it up close and personal. And I really like this tank that's right behind you. 
That is, that's amazing. The pop-up tank was yeah. to give people, and you and I both know that there are a lot of kids and a lot of families in this area, even though they live in this area, don't know. Have never seen it. Have never seen it. Right. And so right. the whole idea is to put them in the middle, in the hole of the donut, yes. and they can stand up and see on a 360 degree basis, they can see these uh, very colorful, beautiful fish uh, swimming all around them. And you know, I'll tell you the other thing, Lou, is, which was amazing to me, not just the fish, but the coral and really living animals. Yeah. I mean, when you really see them That's up close, right. uh, we sometimes see them dried, and that, but these are actually animals. And, and, and in real life, they are. They are animals. Yeah. And that everything in there is real. Some of it is synthetic, but quite yeah. a bit of it is real. And you're quite right. When coral are alive and breathing, uh, they, yeah. are, uh, they are brilliant brilliantly colored. And that's to attract sure. fish and other organisms to them so they can eat them. <laughs> well, well, this is marvelous. The other thing that was really interesting to me is the sphere of science. Science on a sphere. Fi science on a sphere. Yeah. Talk a little bit about yeah, that science and the on concept a, of that. Well, that's, uh, we, I have to give the Quantum Foundation a lot of credit for their help on that. Okay. Uh, we had a clear idea of what we wanted to do and we made the case to them and they had enough faith in us to uh, to go ahead and fund Science on a Sphere. Science on a Sphere is an eight foot diameter globe suspended from the ceiling. And on that globe, are, there are four laser computer projectors and a sound system uh, so, that, so that on the globe is, you can, you can depict the globe as it looks today, real time with the cloud formations and everything yeah. else. This Science on a Sphere has some 600 different programs. So if you, for example, want to recreate the hurricane of 2004, yes. you could show it forming off the coast of Hurricane William, Wilma. Right. See it forming off the coast of Africa, coming across and getting into our back door. If you want to project weather real time today, we can do that. All of the data that, on that is projected on Science on the Sphere comes from either NASA or NOAA, the National Oceanic and, uh, Admin and Atmospheric Administration. Right, right. So it's all government data. Yeah. Uh, you can show the, the migration pattern of the monarch butterfly. You oh, can wow. recreate the tsunami that occurred in Southeast Asia in 2008. You could show the migration pattern of the wildebeest. <laughs> you, can, you can turn the globe into Venus or Mars or the Sun or Saturn and do a class or a show with that. With that, so, yeah. And you say you could, but how do we do that? I well, mean, we what? have, we, <laughs> well, our, obviously, not anyone can do yeah, it. Yeah, right. But, but our, our staff have been trained in how to use this. Okay. And so they've got this little iPad in front of them, and when they're making presentations, they'll punch uh, up, so they'll ask, well, what would you like to see? Yeah. And, well, we'd like to see Jupiter. And boom, and in comes a presentation on Jupiter that, that's already narrated, already narrated, narrated and ready to go. Or if we don't have a staff person there, we'll do a loop of about six or seven shows that we feel will be attractive to people. Yeah. Uh, and so far, people love it. That's great. I mean, great for the kids, but great for the adults just mm -hmm. to understand it. Yeah. And is there another sphere somewhere close to here? Or are you guys? There are only the three only? in Florida. Okay. Uh, one is in Orlando at the Orlando Science Center, and there is one at the uh, Astronaut Hall of Fame in Titusville, Florida. Up near Cape, so Cape South Cape Florida, if you want that, we're the only one in you're South the Florida only one that has it. South Florida Science Center and Aquarium. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's about a two hundred fifty thousand dollar piece of equipment. Great, and uh, it's it's that's fabulous. Top, yeah. top drawer. You can't and I better. assume that subjects can change, and over time, as no d new data comes yeah. in, as people N will no, we have a contract with NOAA, and they just keep sending us stuff as it gets as gets updated. I think, as a matter of fact, we started with about five hundred and eighty different programs and now yeah. we have access to about 600. That's fabulous. Yeah. That's fabulous. Now, the other thing here, uh -huh. you really have enlarged the, the main area so you can have really more traveling exhibits. Yeah. And things. You've got a wonderful exhibit going on right now and it kind of relates yeah. to kind of your background. Yeah, with paleontology. Paleontology, yeah. yeah. Tell, tell us about that. Well, the exhibit we have is called Savage Ancient Seas and it's all about dinosaurs of the deep. Mm. These are animals with very sharp teeth and claws, but, but they swam. Yes. The interesting thing is that most of those animals uh, lived 70 million years ago during the Cretaceous period. And these animals were found, the skeletons were found in places like Kansas, 
yes. Nebraska, the Oklahoma pa Panhandle, North Texas, uh, Eastern Colorado. That's because at that time, 70 million years ago, most of North America was covered by uh, a fairly warm, salty ocean that was about mm. 300 feet deep. Okay. Now this ocean harbored some of the most amazing and largest toothsome creatures that ever lived. I mean, a mosasaur, if a dinosaur, even a T-Rex, yes. got too close to the edge, just like you see crocs and alligators today, got too close, mosasaur would leap up out of the water, grab it by the snout or by the throat, and if it could, would pull it into the water and, and have a very tasty meal. <laughs> <laughs> Megalodon. Yes. Remember Megalodon? Megalodon is the largest shark that ever lived. You or I could go out there into the exhibit and stand up inside the jaws of this shark. In other words, and I'm six feet yeah, two, yeah, yeah. but I would fit just, I would be a snack <laughs> for just this a, animal, as, as you can very, as you can very easily see. Nowhere in the well. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. So this, this, this exhibit has a number of, uh, of those kinds of, uh, of, of toothsome yeah. critters. We also have a, a dig pit for kids to find their own fossils, and we have rubbing stations. Also out there is, 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 uh, is a hurricane chamber. Okay. Uh, this is everyone's opportunity to have their Al Roker moment. <laughs> right here. <laughs> or Jim Santori, <laughs> right, right here. here. Uh, Think of all County. the tourists who come yeah. to Florida and say, I want to be in a hurricane. And just right now, just for about a minute, <laughs> then I'm going back home. <laughs> <laughs> they get their opportunity. You can, right step, here. you can step inside this thing, punch in a button, and experience, you know, 90 mile per hour winds. Okay. Because we have to get ready October 26th, because then we're getting ready for Titanic, yeah. which will be coming in on November 23rd. So the this sea going dinosaur exhibit, uh, Savage Ancient Seas, it's all sea monsters. Yeah, I and understand. if you remember, you know, sailors, ancient sailors used to do, there used yes. to be stories about sea. These animals out there look like what they talked about. When they were there. The Loch, the Loch Ness this monster. Mountain probably looked like you know, Iliamasinosaurus. Well, I tell you, what that says to me is all of South Florida and all the visitors have until October 26th to come and see this. But after that, there's more and more and more. And I tell you, Lou, your, uh, your enthusiasm and passion <laughs> is, is infectious <laughs> to us. And we're just happy yeah. and just pleased that you guys have expanded this and brought this and kept it yeah. in Palm Beach County right next to the zoo. So. Best of luck to you. Thank this you, is Bill. Who your, your passion is really infectious for all of us. So thank you very much for bringing this, for expanding this, for having your vision to do this with all of your staff. We really appreciate it. And your donors and sponsors. And thanks again for being on Cultural Capital. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy always to be with you, Bill. And this is a team effort. It's uh, had a lot of help from people in the community, in particular, a lot of help from the Cultural Council and your colleagues over there. So thanks. we're happy to be here. Great. Well, I hope you enjoy this show on the South Florida Science Center and Aquarium. My name is Bill Nix. Come back next time.